Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, because we are not able to do a Google Meet session together, I am preparing this video so that you guys are at the same level, uh, syllabus-wise, as in Class A, which I managed to do a Google Meet session together. So, this is um, a continuation of Topic 3 specifically on table implementation techniques and table physics. Okay, um, going back to what is done by a compiler in let's analysis space, a compiler will attempt to isolate words. So why do they want to isolate this word? This is so that they can be categorized so that if you have an input like this, integer, y equals to 5 so this is basically a separate token so we have 1 2 3 4 5 so these are five tokens and these tokens will be categorized so what are words in this phase word also known as lexeme or lexical item or lexical tokens are basically string of input characters that is taken as a unit and they will be passed on to the next phase of compilation. Okay, so we know that uh, in the lexical analysis phase, compiler will isolate words and try to categorize them. But how many categories do we have? So if you look at the figure here, we have nine categories. So let's start one by one. The first category is keywords. So keywords are words that have special meaning to compiler. Or some of you uh, may know them as reserved words. So examples of keywords are while, if, else, for, class, array, struct. So these are words that have special meaning to compiler. Okay, the second category is identifiers. So identifiers are words that have special meaning for programmer. For example, if you are developing a system to calculate um, the average of age, so you might want to ask the age from your user. So you would declare integer h so this h over here is your identifier so it has special meaning to you as programmer okay the third category that we have is operators so if you look at the example here we have arithmetic operators we have unary operator like plus plus or uh, minus minus we can also have assignment operator we can also have boolean operators such as bigger than uh, less than, not equal, equal to. So these are operators. The next category is numeric constants. So numeric constants is basically number. Uh, you can accept 1 to 4, 3.4 e plus 6, 0 0.36. So these are all valid numbers. Next is character constants. So you might also know them as string. So everything that is declared um, between these literal um, uh, literal symbols over here, so for example, Malaysia. So this is a character constant or string. Next category is special characters. So special characters are symbols that have special meanings to compilers. So we have like a curly braces, a left parenthesis. Uh, some angle bracket, um, especially semicolon. And then, uh, if you look at the remaining categories, comments, white space, and new line, uh, these are usually detected. They must, the uh, compiler must be able to detect them. However, they are usually, they would be ignored. Okay, so we have nine categories of um, tokens in the lexical analysis phase one of the one of 
the most important task for a compiler is to construct symbol table. So what exactly is symbol table? So symbol table is a data structure that is used to store identifiers. So we have established previously identifiers are um, words that have special meanings to programmers. So these identifiers would contain certain information and compilers must be able to store this information. One of the ways is by using symbol table. So this is one of the most important things to be, to be constructed in the lexical analysis phase. So whenever scanner, scanner is another name for compiler, especially in the lexical analysis phase because in this phase, this is what the scanner will be doing. Sorry, this is what the compiler will be doing. It will be scanning words. So that's why in the lexical analysis phase, compiler is also known as a scanner. So whenever a scanner encounters identifier in your codes, it will construct symbol table. Okay, so what are the things to remember about symbol table? So first of all, the symbol table will store each identifier once no matter how many times it appears in the code. So for example, if you have a program that first you would declare age and then you would do some calculation. Age equals to age plus one. So if you notice in this particular coding, you will encounter age, the identifier age, three times. However, uh, in the symbol table, age is only stored once. Okay, what are the things that are stored associated with this identifier? So first of all, identifier type. So if you're looking at this particular example, the type would be integer. And then what are the associated runtime information? So for example, if you are looking at this um, example, uh, we don't know, we are not, uh, we haven't set up uh, any values. But if you have like integer h equals to 27, the runtime information for the value assigned would be 27. Okay, so there may also be other information such as uh, which line in the coding in which um, the identifier age was first declared. So these are all associated runtime information. Okay, next. Uh, what if the identifiers are declared within a block structured language. So for example, if you have a coding like this and then you have a function in the middle. So for example, if I have a function to calculate some stuff. So in this uh, function calculate, I have number one integer. So outside of this block, outside of this block, uh, I, will, uh, I cannot call the function num1. So even if I have num1 outside of this block, it is not the same num1 that is declared here. So the way that a compiler address this is it will construct separate symbol table for each block. And it will specify the block scopes in the symbol table. Okay, next. Additionally, in symbol table, if you um, have values that is in this form, it must be converted to a form that a computer can do arithmetic operations on. So, for example, if I have integer salary equals to 3.4e plus 6, this value over here will be converted to this form first before it is stored in the symbol table. Okay, next. Okay. Uh, I think I have, uh, we have established this information previously. In the lexical analysis phase, compiler will not check for syntax. So syntax checking is not done yet. So if you have something like this, and this is not a valid syntax, the lexical analysis phase will still put out five tokens. This is 
one token, two token, three token, four token, and five tokens. So it will still try to categorize this token. It will not check for proper syntax yet. And then if a source language if a source language is not case sensitive, the scanner or the compiler must also accommodate this feature. So for example, if you are writing your coding uh, using all lower cases, the compiler must be able to know that it means the same thing as this. But for Java, you have to remember Java is case sensitive. Okay, next. So the output of lexical analysis is basically streams of tokens. So streams of tokens is made up of two things. So first of all, what is the class of the token? Next, what is the value associated with that token? An input to a lexical analysis might look like this and the output can be written like this. So where do you get all these token classes from? So you actually get this from the slide where uh, you have the categories. Uh, remember the slide where one is uh, keywords and number two is identifiers. Okay, so these numbers over here are the corresponding token classes. But for the purpose of our CSC 569 syllabus, you do not have to remember the token classes. You do not have to remember the number of the token class. You just need to know what are the categories. So for example, if you are looking at this input here, while is a keyword, total is identifier, semicolon, a special character so you need to know these tokens belong to which categories remembering the token classes is not as important okay next let's take a look at, let's take a look at an example previously we have discussed about finite state machine and we said that finite state machine is one of the tool that we can use for lexical analysis so how can we do that so if you look at this example, it says it says that this is a finite set machine that is able to accept um, valid identifiers. So if we if we try to list down valid Java identifiers, um, you can have something like num1. You can have something like name. You can have something like uh, number. But you cannot have something like one Malaysia. So uh, let's try to check one by one. We start with the first one, which is num1. Um, L is a range of letter from A to Z, and D is a range of digits from 0 to 9. So if you want to check num1, it will go N, uh, U, M, 1. Num1, so this is accepted. Okay, how about name? So it will go N A M E. So name is accepted. Okay, next, how about number? It will go N U M B E R. Number. Number is accepted. And finally, how do we check? Uh, we will check the last one. 1 Malaysia. So 1 is a digit. So we will go this way. 1 M-A-L-A-Y-S-I-A. -A -A -A. And this is non-accepting state. This is a dead state. Therefore, 1 Malaysia is not accepted. So this is an example of a finite state machine that is capable of uh, accepting some strings and rejecting the rest. So, the list of the strings accepted by this finite state machine are basically valid identifiers. Okay, next. This is a finite state machine that can accept numeric constants. So, what are some 
examples of numeric constant. You can have something like 29.3. You can have 325. Uh, you can have 3.4e plus 6. So now let's try to check um, these values one by one. Okay. 2, 9, Point three. So this is the subject. Next, uh, three zero zero point two five. Okay, this is also a subject. Okay, what about the last one? Three point four e plus six. This is also a subject. Therefore, all these three are valid numeric constants. And then let's take a look at another example. And this is a, key, a finance set machine that can recognize certain keywords. So if you see here, a list of keywords that can be recognized by this machine. Uh, if we start here, this is the starting state. We can accept if. Uh, you can accept INT, you can accept import, you can accept for, you can accept float. Okay, so these are examples of a finance machine that can recognize certain keywords. Okay, next let's move on to the concept of tables. In lexical analysis, there are lots of tables to be created. So it can be symbol table, numeric constant table, string constant table, statement labels table, and line numbers table. Therefore, we would need a strategy uh, to come up or to build these tables. Let's talk about the first implementation technique to create tables. Okay, but before that, when we talk about tables, you need to remember that tables are not necessarily looking like this. So array or linked list can also be considered as tables. And the first technique that we are discussing uh, called sequential search, it, the form is a table that is organized as array or linked list. So each time a word is encountered, list will be scanned and if the word is not already in the list, it will be added at the end. So let's take a look at this list of words. So the list of words, uh, we have three words, uh, sorry, six words. Frog, tree, hill, bird, bat, cat. And we start with the first one. So the first one is frog. So frog uh, is the first um, in the list. So frog would be uh, at the very beginning of the list. The next word in the list is tree. So we need to compare first tree with frog because tree is not frog and frog is the end of the list so we add tree. Same goes for hill, bird, bat and cat. So this is sequential search and uh, it takes this amount of time to build it. So let's discuss what are the advantage of sequential search. The advantage is it is very easy to implement. So you just scan the list. If it's not in the list and you have reached the end of the list, so you add the new word uh, at the end of the list. However, the disadvantage is it is not efficient, especially when number of words become large. Therefore, if you are constructing symbol tables, um, sequential search is not the best technique to build this table. Okay, the second technique to uh, build tree is called binary search tree. So in a binary search tree, the table is organized as binary tree where the left subtree is the preceding word and the right subtree is the following word. So we start uh, with an empty tree and the first encountered word will be placed at the root. So when a word, a W, is encountered, W will be compared with root. 
So if W is lesser than the root, we place it at the left subtree. But if W is bigger than the root, we place it at the right subtree. If W is the root, it means it is already in the tree. So we will repeat until W is found or we insert at the last node. So this is how uh, the tree is constructed. So our list has frog, tree, hill, bird, bat, and cat. So frog is the first word, therefore frog is the root. Next tree. Tree alphabetically is bigger than frog, therefore tree would be at the right. Next word in the list is hill. So first of all, we need to compare frog with hill. So hill is bigger than frog, so it should be on the right side. But hill is smaller than tree, so hill would be on the left side. Okay, the next word is bird. So when we compare bird with frog, bird is smaller. So bird is on the left side. The next word is bat. Bat is smaller than frog and bat is smaller than bird. So bat is on the left side. And final word is cat. Cat is smaller than frog. Cat is bigger than bird. So this is where it is located. So even though binary search tree is a better technique as compared to sequential search, it can still construct a tree that is not balanced. So if you look at list number two, where the list of words are bat, bird, cat, frog, hill, and tree, and you look at the search tree constructed from this list, We can see that this list is not balanced. This tree is not balanced. So even though binary search tree is a better technique than sequential search, it is not the best technique. Now, let's take a look at the third implementation technique. So the third implementation technique is called hash table. So in this technique, the table will be organized as array or array of linked lists. So we will start with an array of null pointers of a specific size. So this array are null and each of these is a hit of linked list. So the word will be added to list and hash function will be used to determine where do we start the list. So the chosen list for example, if we have chosen this list, we will search sequentially until the word is found. Or if it's not found, it will be added at the end of the list. So, in order to construct a good hash table, we need to have a good hash function. So, what is a hash function? Hash, hash function is a function that uses the word as argument and what we get is the subscript to array of pointers. It will return uh, the subscript to array of pointers. So this is an example of a hash function. So first of all, we take the length of the word and uh, sum it with the ASCII code of the first letter. And then we divide the value of the first operation with the array size and get the remainder. So this is basically or more the list operation. Okay, and the third thing to do is the remainder would be the subscript to array. So this is where our link list should be. So selecting a good hash function is very important because a good hash function will result in high efficiency in constructing the table. Okay. Let's take a look at an example here. So as we have established, this is our hash function and the list of the words are again frog, tree, hill, bird, bat and cat. So we start with frog. Frog is a four letters word. One, two, three, four. That's why we have four over here. And one, zero, two is the ASCII for F. So 4 plus 102 divided by 6, you get 4 as the remainder. So 
six over here is the array size. One, two, three, four, five, six. The array size is six. And then we get four as the, as the, remain, the remainder. Uh, four is where our linked list should start. And again, you have to remember, this is, a, this is an array. Therefore, the address starts from zero. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. So, frog should be placed at location address four. And because frog is the first word, we start here. So, this is frog. The next word in the list is three. Three is the four letter words. 116 is the ASCII for T divided by 6. The remainder is 0. So starting from address 0, 3 is the first word. So 3 is here. Hill, we get 0. Uh, so um, 3 is already in the address 0 of the linked list. And then we add hill after 3. And then bird is again 0. So bird is after hill. Bat is 5, so at location 5, we add bat, and cat is at 0, and after bird, we add cat, and the remaining, we cross out. Okay, so this is how to build a hash table. Next, let's talk about a software that can be used to construct a compiler. And in this particular case, to construct a scanner, which is the capability of the compiler in lexical analysis. So the software that we'll be using is called Sable CC. So Sable CC is a tool that is capable of generating compiler automatically from a set of specification. So who is going to set this specification? We. We as programmers, we as users, we are the one who will set the specification. So what are the advantages of Civil CC? So it uses Java. Uh, the compilation errors are easier to fix. It will generate modular software where each class is in a separate file. Uh, it will generate syntax tree where atoms or code can be automatically generated from the tree. And finally, it is better than Java CC. So in order for us to use Sable CC as a tool, we need to prepare an input file. So this input file will be in the form of grammar. So just like if you want to create a web page, you need to create a file of type HTML. So for example, index.html. If you want to create a compiler using Sable CC, the input must be in the form of grammar. So, for example, if the name of your language is cat, so it will be cat.grammar. Okay, so in this grammar file, which you can construct using not that we can have six sections. So for lexical analysis, we will specifically be using helpers, these and tokens. And in our tutorials, we will especially look at helpers and tokens. Okay, so a grammar file will be arranged like this. So first of all, we're going to have a declaration of package, helpers, state, and tokens. This is especially for lexical analysis. So it is important to remember that for stable CC, all names must be in lowercase, and you can also use underscore. So all capital letters are not accepted. And then token declaration is compulsory. Helpers and states are optional. Okay. All lexical tokens must be declared. They must be given name and they must be defined. So this is the format of token declaration. 
So, for example, left underscore parent is this symbol. Left parenthesis is that symbol. And if I want to declare something called right parenthesis, I would do it like this. Right underscore parent is this symbol and I end it with semicolon. So this is the format for token declaration. So what are the things that can be defined as token? So first of all, um, a character in single quotes. So a single W, a single Z, a single Y. And then uh, any character. So the dollar sign, the exclamation mark, um, the hash sign. Uh, it can also be a single number. 9, 7, um, 8. So these are all can be uh, token definition. Okay, next, it can also be a number representing ASCII code. So what are ASCII codes? So ASCII codes are related to the keys in your keyboard. So for the example given here, 13 is the key for new line. 30, 13 is actually correlated to the enter key in your keyboard. Okay, token can also be a set of characters. So the set of characters can be arranged. So if you define it this way, uh, it means um, all letters from A to Z, uh, all lowercase let all lowercase letters from A until Z. And this is all capital letters from A to Z. And this is all numbers from 0 to 9. So if you want to define range, you must enclose them in angle brackets and you have this double dot in the middle. Okay, next. Token definition can also be union of two sets. So if you look here, when you union these two ranges, what you get is all letters regardless if they are capital or lowercase letters. Next. It can also be a difference of two sets, so from 0 up until 127. So these are responding to the ASCII of your keyboard. And you minus them with tab and new line. So this is all ASCII except tab and new line. It can also be a string of characters in single quotes, for example, while. If you want to define... Um, Keywords, so you might want to use something like this inside single quote. So while, for, um, if, uh, class. So this is string of characters and single quotes, and it can also be regular expression. So what are the regular expression operations that you can do on several CC? So the operations are this. First of all, uh, just like regular expression that we have learned in previous class, everything that is inside bracket must be completed first. So this specify the order of operation. Next, you can do concatenation, union, clean star. Okay, so this is something new. This is P plus. So what is P plus? P plus basically mean um, one or more instance of so if I have P plus, uh, my list of uh, strings would be something like P, 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 la, la, la. Okay, so this is P plus. Okay, and then P question mark. So P question mark is 0 or 1. It's either you do not have P or you have a single P. Okay. Next, when two tokens definitions match input, the one that is matching longer input string is selected. So, for example, if you have WHI uh, is the token for um, identifier, and then you have WHILE is token for keyword, and you enter WHILE, so it will be detected as keyword. Okay, how about the second one? When two token definitions match input string of the same length, the token that is listed first is selected. So to understand this, look at the examples here. We have two boxes. This is box A and this is box B. So imagine if you are entering while and you want while to be detected as keyword. 
while as a whole can also be detected as identifier because if you look at the definition of identifier over here, a range of A until Z plus, plus means what? One or more. So you can have WHILE. WHILE can be detected as, as identifier. But if you want it to be detected as keywords, you need to declare it in the form of this B box over here where keyword is uh, defined first and identifier is defined second. So here, while will be detected as keyword. So this is what this particular sentence means. Okay. And helpers. Helpers are basically used to simplify token definition. So uh, if you look at this example over here, the helpers are used to define digit, letters, sign, new line, and tab. And as for the tokens definition, they are just calling all the helpers that has been defined. Therefore, it will mm, result in a clearer tokens definition. Um, something that is um, very well arranged. So that's it. That's the end of topic three. Um, after the semester break, we're going to start with topic four. Meanwhile, take good care of yourself and I'll see you after the break. Thank you.